Glass and Company Johannesburg office, where we are pleased to present um, the fourth edition of our legacy exhibitions titled Three or Invisible Connections, looking at the work of Mary Sibande and uh, Dorothy Kay. And I'm very pleased to be here with Mary, um, who is an exceptionally busy lady. Um, so we really appreciate you being here. Um, and with Gordon Froud, um, HOD of the um, Visual Art Department in UJ, amongst other things like being an award-winning artist um, and gallerist. Um, and so yes, welcome to both of you and thank you so much for making the time to be here. It's great to be here. Um, I mean, this is obviously the first time you're walking in here and, and looking at the at the exhibition. So, um, sort of first thoughts? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was looking forward to, to something that this blew me away. Yeah. Yeah. Um, actually, one of the first thing that I that I saw when I walked in here, I went straight to the to the figurines. I haven't seen them in one space at the same time. So for me, it's just, you know, when I got here, I just started getting other pictures of, okay, this can actually continue. This could be, you know, an extensive body of work. So, mm. I mean, this is definitely the, the sort of the show stopper at the moment. Yes. It's mm. capturing everybody's attention and everyone's eyes. Um, but I mean, let's just start off with, um, well, both of you, I mean, you guys have quite a unique and special relationship. Um, and that started, I'm assuming, when you were uh, Mary's lecturer for sculpture. Yes. Um, Mary was one of our third year students in my first year of teaching in the UK many years ago. And yeah, she finished up with us and then came back a couple of years later to do her BTEC at that point. And then of course she also works um, in my gallery running our project room at Bordeaux Gallery for nearly five years. Yeah. And had a first show there, so it was so nice to see you to come full circle to where you are now. Yeah. I can live vicariously through my students. Mm. And I can see the pride when you look at the sculptures and the yeah. works. And, and I mean, yeah, you've been exceptionally busy with many, many exhibitions and solo shows in literally just the past year. Um, I mean, with Frist Art Museum in Tennessee, in Nash Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, and that ended in January this this year. Yeah, it was a it was a great show. Um, yeah, and I got to see some pieces that I haven't seen in in a few years. No, that's good. Yeah. Uh, I mean, one of my favorite pieces of yours is um, Madam C J Walker and that beautiful installation. Um, can you sort of tell us a bit about it? I mean, Madam C J Walker is it was a, it was a figure that that spoke to you and especially to um, your mother as well and the connection between the two. Um, so initially my work was, um, I was looking at my personal history and um, I was looking at the women in my family who were all domestic workers. Um, in a way I was trying to understand myself as uh, a black woman um, living in post, uh, post apartheid South Africa. And what does it mean? What does it mean to actually interact with other races? Um, I, I speak of races in that, um, well I speak of race in, in South Africa. Um, racism and race has um, actually was the wall that um, divided people. Um, a few years ago, it was 2008, I was in New York for the first time. Um, I was doing a residency um, at the Amberson Foundation. Oh, yes, yes um, on my Jack Ginsburg. Yeah. Um, so that was my first time in New York, and of course, New York, you know, New yeah. York, the city that never sleeps and there's just lights everywhere. Um, I came across um, a story of Madame C.J. Walker. Um, so I started reading up with this, this icon that I was just blown away. Um, so I first, first saw her, the image of, 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 of this icon um, at the Mad Museum. And I was drawn to it. Um, but I, when I was reading um, about her history, there was a parallel, parallel history between my mother and, 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 and Madame C.J. Walker. So, and I was like, how is this relationship? And I wanted to go deeper into this relationship that I was actually seeing. And of course, these women were born in different times, different centuries, and also different continents, um, America and, and South Africa or Africa. Um, so what, what the, the relation is um, that they were both um, working with hair. And of course, hair is very important in the black um, in the black community. How you wear your hair, whether you have an afro like mine, or you have dreadlocks, or you have a weave, you know, it's um, it says a lot about who you are or what you want to be. 
Um, so it's part of um, um, an identity of warrior, of, of, of a person. It has become a, a pivotal uh, way of introducing yourself before you say your name. Mm -hmm. um, so I was just talking about the topic of thinking of the hair issues, of Pretoria girls. And exactly. Yeah. 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 It's still very topical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I was drawn to this and then, um, so I started molding my mom's story around Madame C.J. Walker's story. And then just these women, just, you know, that just created, and I'm creating an explosion. I created this artwork titled my, A Conversation with Madame C.J. Walker. So it was my mom having a conversation with Madame C.J. Walker about mm hair. -hmm. And then this, the sculpture is of, um, uh, and it's a life-size figure, I'm knitting um, an image of Madame C.J. Walker. But um, I've created this character, or you can say an avatar named Sophie. So whatever Sophie does, um, it's, it's, it, 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 it's, it's, it surrounds itself with magic. It's all magical. So she's standing two meters away from the wall and she's knitting this image of an icon using um, extensive um, hair extensions. Mm -hmm. And I love that how, it's, how there's a physical connection between mm -hmm. the two. I mean, it's a, it's a stunning, stunning piece. Yeah, between the photographic and and, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think a word that you, you used um, with Mary's work is transcendence. Yes. Yeah. I, I was thinking about that earlier today um, when I was looking at Mary's work in the context of the bigger South African picture and what have you, and looking at great icons like Mama and Maria Mabasa, mm -hmm. and then just trying to place where Mary fits in. You know, the word that came to mind was transcendence, mm -hmm. the idea that the works move beyond just being reportage or representing people in a particular way, but that they're aspirational, they move beyond the everyday, and they're so aspirational that you don't have to be a black woman to understand that. Mm -hmm. Any of us can hone into these figurines, particularly, almost in the way that you would do with an avatar or a figure from a game, and imagine the sources or the, the scale line or something like that. And they move beyond, so the story becomes universal. As opposed to just merely being a side of the story. Yeah. That would be a universal quality too. Yeah. I mean, another work that, that's sort of quite uh, show stopping and is getting a lot of attention is, is the work to everything there is a season. Um, and it, it looks like quite a, a complex work. Do you want to sort of talk us through that work a bit and, and sort of also the sort of motifs that you have within the work? Um, so when I was conceptualizing around that work, the idea I was going through. Um, I'll say an, um, a lot of unsureness. I was moving galleries and at some point I thought, oh, I just want to leave arts. I don't want to make art anymore. And, and I think I, I took a break. I took a break for about three years where I wasn't making anything. Um, and then this was the first work that actually that, that I made after, um, after that break in that world. An, an unintentional break. Um, but um, for me, it was just, you know, summoning all my ways of making art, summoning all my powers. Now I'm putting myself into a comic book, summoning all my powers into uh, coming back into this world that I love. I love making art. And I think this is, um, it's always been a conversation that um, Gordon and I always had when, when I used to work at Gordon Gallery. We always talk about art and where I see myself in the future. And I remember the first time also, you know, first time I went to Europe, was actually born and said, you need to go to Europe, you need to go see the world. And that's how you can actually grow your ideas and, and just, you know, like blow, go blow your mind. And I did. And when I got back, I just, you know, it was a, you know, a 360 idea, which is, you know, um, I just wanted to dive into it and just be a full-time artist. Um, so when I speak of summoning, um, there's, a, there's a figure that behind the, 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 the foreground figure. Um, she's wearing purple and her arms are stretched out and she looks like she's um, gathering these, um, these dark clouds. Yeah. So the idea of calling or the idea of knowing the future has always been part of my art making. Um, if you look at this figure right here, co-wielding. So um, I think at some point, um, I think we're all obsessed or we all have want to know what will happen tomorrow. Mm -hmm. But uh, because we are merely human, we don't have those powers. So, but with art, I have, I, I have, I, I, I have created this ability of, you know, creating another world or, or, or constructing another world. So, art has um, afforded that, uh, that quality for me. Mm -hmm. 
So this figure, um, it's, it's, it's the high priestess, she's throwing these cards in the air and um, she's, um, she's going into her, into her head, sort of like um, Noria Mabasa when she is dreaming about her sculptures because she, um, she once said in an interview that she doesn't make um, work until she dreams about it. She doesn't plan it. Yeah, like, so it just comes dream. into 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 a dream form and then she'll wake up the next day and then make whatever she saw in her dream. So for me that was it's 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 that idea of just dreaming it and making it. And tapping into another consciousness. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So this figure is actually um is 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 encompassing that, is is holding that also through her cards. Interesting. And then, I mean, and a colour so so prominent in your work, and I mean, it's, I mean, even the the exhibition that you your solo exhibition that you just had was titled uh, Blue, Purple, Red. And I mean, just I mean, I know there's there's a lot you can probably say about each of the colours, but yeah. in in sort of a short uh, summary, why are those colours so prominent to you? Um, colours played an important role in my art career, in my art making, in my art practice. So the initial colour was blue. So for me, blue was um, looking at uh, the blue collar. Mm -hmm. um, so in South Africa, um, uh, I would say like usually when, when I was growing up, uh, the, the domestic workers used to wear like different shades of blue. Yeah. Uh, or when you see a guy dealing on the street, they're wearing blue overalls. So it has that um, it has that connotation for me, the blue. And then I moved to, to the purple. So the purple, I started letting go of um, the stories of the women in my family. I started, to look, I started to look at myself. And when I thought of, if I were to bring myself into um, this world of art making or art practice, how do I actually talk about myself? And um, so I did some research on color and I came across um, the color purple. And I remember a few years before that, I watched the movie, The Color Purple. Mm -hmm. in, um, mm -hmm. Yes, and that, of course, it, it, it talks about um, slavery in the South, but it was, it, it was an amazing story, but it was also far, far, far away from me as an African. Mm -hmm. And then uh, also in Europe, the purple color um, speaks of, um, speaks of uh, clergy or, or royalty, or royalty. Uh, but those ideas are far away from me. It was just, you know, something that I hold um, at the back of my head. When you go to the east, the highest Buddha was purple. So I had this association of this color. It's like actually a special color, um, except for gold. Yeah. Um, and, but all these ideas were far away from me as, as an African. And then one day I came across them. The, there was a purple march that happened in Cape Town in 1989. Yes. People were marching against apartheid, and the apartheid um, the police laced the water cannon with purple dye. And I like the idea of um, marking people. Like, what does it mean to mark people? And also marking them in purple dye. And why does it stay on the skin longer than any other colors? So enter the purple phase. So I created um, an extensive um, uh, expensive uh, uh, body of work and we are just you know looking at myself and looking at the world and also like I'm um, just bringing all my my travels into into my art career so the, and, and 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 I like what Gordon um, uh, mentioned earlier on like this is actually well I am the storyteller but at the same time anyone can relate to this because the, these are stories of the world mm -hmm. so the story that um, she's projecting is not only about me but everyone everyone and so it's open to anyone so that's why it has the relationship doesn't matter where you are in terms of your color doesn't matter where you are in terms of your geography um, this avatar can actually relate to you. And it's universal, yeah. And yeah. It's universal, yeah. I mean, one of the connections that we that, that we made with this exhibition is uh, we're using the term intertextuality. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously in Dorothy Kay's work, you can kind of see how she references her work in later works. Um, and, and it's also very relevant in your work, where you reference, um, especially certain, like, for example, you reference this work in to everything there is another season and you know the use of the s in the card where with the use of the s in the superman and so there's this all, this connection between your works mm -hmm. um, and that's sort of one of the connections that, that we made between your work and obviously Dorothy Kay and even though you come from two completely different sort of eras as well mm -hmm. but back to these these bronzes I mean they like I said they are one of the highlights of the show and um, I mean Gordon do you want to speak a bit about the about these bronzes yeah um, they're a magnificent body of work but 
what I quite like about them is the, the fact that it's a story that's come full circle. In the early days of Gordart Otto, who runs Bronze Age, actually had an exhibition of little artworks of various artists, including his own work. And so that was the first time that Mary probably officially met him. And now many years later, he's produced this incredible body of work. And I must say, the casting of these is world class. You know, this stuff could be hanging in the Met or in the Momo in New York, and everyone would swear it was made by Jeff Koons' studio. They were that well produced. I also like the way that, that you've used the, the oil paint as a surface as opposed to patina. Tell us about that choice. Um, I, I, I tried because I think it was um, initially um, that we were experimenting on if. Um, what should I use, patina or colour? But of course, uh, colour is what makes my work, the foundation of my work. So uh, the patina didn't, wasn't strong enough, it wasn't uh, bright enough or vivid enough. Um, so, we, um, so we opted in, in painting them um, with oil. Mm. And, and for me, it's just the idea of just sh the, the, the shimmer on, on the surface and how the... the lusciousness. Yeah, it just it brings out like the, 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 the blue is blue, it's full saturated, it's saturated, the red is red. And we were able to control um, different reds, um, different tones of red or different tones of blue. And um, the oil um, has allowed us to, to do that. And, um, and I think, because um, at first we were experimenting, and I think this is the future. Mm -hmm. Just painting them yeah. in oil. Painting what I particularly them. love about these works, because they're, they're, they're smaller work versions of, of what could potentially be much larger works, is the attention to detail. You know, the little figure behind with the little pool, the mm -hmm. metal pool that's happening on there, the, the hemming of the surfaces uh, of the edges and whatever, mm -hmm. that attention to detail. Mm -hmm. It's, it's so just really mm -hmm. such a beautiful thing. And there's where I think you're your use of oil was a very clever idea because to try and patina those little details would have been near impossible. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's really turned them into quite a magical and, and spectacular pieces. Thank you. Yeah. And also um, the idea of making these figurines, like my work is big, it's large, sometimes yeah. it's larger than that. Uh, but at some point I wanted to pay attention to details. Mm -hmm. And then as you mentioned, like these mm -hmm. words are you know, like they have to, but you have to go closer it's to them. There's, there's, yeah, there's that intimacy. Unlike the big work, you have to stand back so you can experience them. But here you have to go closer and, 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 and look at these works. And I think, um, and sometimes the other day I was just thinking, why did it take forever to make these small figures? But at the same time, I think I wasn't ready. It wasn't time. Sure. Yeah. The, the nice thing about them as well is that even though they're, they're small in scale, they're still very monumental. Mm. You know, these things have the power of a piece that's three meters high, even though they're in stem. And then the one piece that's slightly different to this is the one that is cast in resin. Tell, tell us the story of that. Uh, I think it's a very beautiful option mm -hmm. in, in the process and to see the light coming through it yeah. with the blue-green of the soldier. But tell us why that is a choice. Um, so the idea was um, I wanted to bring the, uh, the, the concept of, 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 of play uh, oh, the toy like toy, toy of, mm -hmm. yeah, toy like. Um, so this can actually, you know, like kids can actually relate to it. And like my child loves this, <laughs> and in comparison to the rest. So the idea of toy um, um, is part of this this figurine, and um, and I thought, well, it won't make sense if we make them in bronze because bronze is heavy. It looks heavy. Uh, but if what happens if we make them in um, in a plastic life form? So it's like an extension of the small toy soldiers that you buy from yeah. um, a toy shop. Uh, we decided to cast them in in, in resin. In that um, the concept of t toy is part of you know it's the basis of what makes the work work. Um, so in in a, in a way, I don't think it would have made sense if it was cast in bronze. Um, so it's just you know it's a continuation of how do we actually. Um, um, announce the idea of toy, or how do we actually highlight the idea of toy? And I think um, um, this this material works with the with the concept. Mm. I mean, these 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 sculptures you refer to as, as basically miniatures, and I mean they definitely are mini. I can tell you that they, they are. But in comparison to, like you said, your larger works, I mean you you've literally worked in in, in such a range of scale. 
And I mean, what was it like working from sort of something this size to something larger? What were the difficulties that you had working with your various materials as well as scale? In fact, it was the other way around. You had big pieces to the little. Yeah, yeah. Because you started off on a bigger scale yeah. and then came down to, to these. Yeah. Um, well, the larger pieces, there was just this freedom that I can actually use my body, that the whole body can actually be in the work. And then he had to zoom in, but initially it was just um, there was just this um, this unsureness. Like I wasn't even sure. Like, am I going to do it right? Is it going to work? Because I'm just so you know like so out there, like using my arms, you know, you know, 360. And yeah, just about zooming in and just you know picking each and every button has to be there. So there was um, initially there was this um, idea of just you know. Uh, or difficulty into into adjusting my brain, you know, into looking looking into small things. Uh, but now I think I think I'm gonna make more. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> well, I hope so because I mean they are magnificent. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I think these are a very fitting kind of um, place within the bigger South African um, kind of iconography of sculpture in South Africa. And I think you're very much in a position. To, re, to establish, establish yourself as one of the greats within that kind of process within South Africa. So to me, it's a very, very exciting development. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, you've got, yeah, you've, this is obviously just one of the, the many exhibitions that you've got this year, and you've also got a showing at the Durban Art Gallery as well. Um, and so, yeah, I really appreciate you coming here. You as well, Gordon. It's so lovely to have you both here. And yeah, we look forward to seeing more. Yes, absolutely.